mission in Aksum was quite successful. I sold all of my grain and bought some casks of wine, olive oil and spices. Those goods would be sure to fetch a good price at home. I looked up from the accounts and rubbed my eyes, tired from reading by the light of a single candle. Everything all right with the camels? I said to greet the boy. He nodded. I offered him a cup of tea and responded. Let me tell you more about Yodi before we turn in. After marrying Prince Anobis, Yodi had to be patient for her vengeance. Her husband had to become king and build a larger army if they were to ever defeat the mighty Aksumite Empire. Five years had passed since Anobis had taken the throne when Yodi learned that the Aksumite king, Dagnashan, was planning a military expedition to the east. If she could send an elite force to ambush and kill Dagnajan, the Aksumite Empire would be severely crippled. News of Dagnajan's death reached the city of Aksum. Both of his sons tried to seize the throne for themselves. A civil war broke out and the once mighty empire began to crumble. Of course, your did a soft snoring drew my attention to my son. The lad was already sleeping. Outside the northern gate, the camels groaned. Irritated by the traders mounting the animals to begin the long journey back to the Ethiopian highlands. Drivers urged the large caravan forward with loud shouts and cracking whips. As I took my place next to my boy, the sun slowly began to rise above the hills. Not far from the gate, we passed a field of great stone stele. Some stood tall, reaching for the sky, but mostly toppled, their pieces scattered over the ground. Father, Daniel asked, looking up at the towering stele. When we entered the city, he told me that these stones marked the graves of ancient kings. Is Dagrajan buried here as well? I shook my head. No, my son. Those kings are long dead, and the body of Dagnajan was never recovered. His two sons were far too busy trying to slay each other. While the Aksumite Empire was divided by civil war, Yodit ordered a fleet to be built. An invading force would cross the Red Sea and strike hard at Musawa, the most important harbor of the empire. Kidejan had managed to kill his brother and take the throne in the meantime. He had also lost the north to Yodit. Soon she would advance to the capital for the final battle. Before I could dispel Daniel's youthful naivety about warfare, shouts arose from the front of the caravan to stop for the night. The caravan had stopped at the top of a hill after a long day of traveling. Some merchants sat around the campfire, sharing wineskins and roasting a goat. Others were already pitching their tents. Up here, the nights could be very cold. Daniel had just finished his portion of goat. Father, would you finally tell me how Yodit became queen of Aksu? Before I could respond, Tariku, an old lean merchant with white hair, stood up. He stared fiercely at my son with his one eye. So you want to hear about our good queen? Tariku fought against Yodit's troops in Aksum, I whispered to my son. Daniel could only nod to the one-eyed man. Thirty years ago, Tariku began solemnly. I was patrolling the northern hills of Aksu, and suddenly I saw a sea of banners in the distance. The sun reflected upon rows of armored men. Yodit had finally arrived to destroy the cradle of Ethiopian civilization. I shivered, but her fury was legendary. I saw how Gidijan finally fell, his body covered with blood. He was wrong to kill his brother, yes, but he was the rightful heir to the throne. 
I tried to defend my homeland from disaster and lost my eye for it. A small price for such an honor. Now you remember this well, boy. Your deed's rise to the throne was not some glorious adventure. It was a bloody mess. The old man leaned back, sighing. Glancing at my son, I noticed that he suddenly seemed older than he had this morning. Nobody dared to whisper another word. Egypt. A month since I entered the Holy Land. I was in a foreign land, and I was dying. I wandered the cold desert for four nights before the horse archers found me. I had abandoned my mount to the vultures, and my armor to the heat of day. For a night, I was not much of a threat to them. I thought these men were Turks, come to toy with their prey. But when I could distinguish the riders from the blur of the mirage, I saw that they were Saracens, the rulers of the Middle East. I had ridden to the Holy Land with the Crusaders from France and Normandy, so I was by all rights the Saracens' enemy. Yet they gave me water and a spindly horse and led me back to their leader. And that was how I met Saladin. The paintings in Europe show Saladin as a demonic barbarian. Yet he's more chivalrous than any knight I'd met before and prefers the palaces of Damascus to slaughtering Normans in the desert. I had not expected hospitality from Saracens. We Normans execute any armed Arab we capture. But Saladin left me free to explore his camp. Perhaps he wants an objective observer to chronicle the prodigious bloodshed ahead. Saladin's army is heading south to Egypt to reinforce Cairo. Egypt is a tempting prize for the Crusaders. She was fabulous and wealthy, yet governed by an ineffectual fool. Before my capture, I was en route to join in the Crusaders' assault on Egypt. It is a bitter irony that now I shall view the contest from the enemy camp. So it was that I found myself less than a hundred miles from the Dead Sea, in the company of my enemies. The Franks are dispersed, and the Egyptian army broken. Saladin has taken his place as governor of the Nile. <laughs> Any European king would seize this opportunity to eliminate his political enemies. Saladin, however, allowed any Egyptian opposed to his rule to leave the city unharmed. Saladin has set out to win over the population. In Cairo, he built mosques and palaces, universities and hospitals. My own countrymen, the sons of Europe, showed naught but treachery, while the Saracens worked to dignify their civilization. It is a troubling time, and I have difficulty sleeping. The holy city of Medina, year 15 of my capture. Volumes have I filled with my fatigued writings. Lord Saladin reads them only rarely. He speaks of greater events yet to come. The political boundaries in this endless desert have shifted as a result of three crusades. Four crusader states now exist in the Holy Land. After the Saracen victory in Egypt, the crusader leaders realized that Saladin was worthy of their concern. They were quick to suggest a treaty. I hoped that with peace at last upon us, I would be returned to my own folk. But this peace, so short-lived, is already broken. And it is not Saracen, but Crusader, that has violated his word of honor. Reynald de Chatillon, a wicked French knight, has been raiding Arab territory in defiance of the treaty. He attacks trade caravans, and his pirate ships threaten the Saracen holy cities of Medina and Mecca. Saladin, in his fury, has sworn to kill Reynald with his own hands. Although I am still a prisoner, Saladin and his generals dine with me. Over meals, we discuss mathematics and astronomy. I never imagined a race of desert folk could be so wise. Baghdad, the Saracen capital, is the most civilized city in the world. 
with free hospitals, public baths, a postal service, and banks with branches as far away as China. But as we eat, talk inevitably turns to war. Reynard's pirate vessels now rot at the bottom of the Red Sea. His raids have stopped. Reynald has escaped, but I suspect Saladin shall neither forgive nor forget. Galilee, year 20 of my capture. Last night, we rode into a sandstorm. The men dared not open their mouths to speak. We clung to the necks of horses or camels while waves of sand rose and fell around us. The Saracens have pursued a large force of Europeans into the desert. The Crusaders carry with them a relic, a piece of the true cross. Capturing this artifact will deal a severe blow to the morale of Saladin's Christian peoples. I asked Saladin why we were here, miles from civilization and water. He said, to bring crimson death to the blue-eyed enemy. The huge Crusader army has halted to make it stand beneath the two peaks called the Horns of Hattin. At the Horns is only a single pool of water, and Saladin controls it. At night, the Saracens ride out and extravagantly pour out vessels of water into the sand and within sight of the thirst-crazed Europeans. It is cruelty worthy of all. Fighting was fierce. The Crusaders had to conquer or die. Mostly, they died. Saladin has treated his prisoners well, providing them with ice water from the mountains and comfortable tents. For the first time in years, I have been able to speak to fellow countrymen, but I am unsure what to say to these invaders. Not all of the prisoners were treated so royally. Reynald de Chatillon was captured here and fulfilling his vow. Saladin sliced off Reynald's head with his own scimitar. How ironic that it was only after the Crusaders entered their lands that the Saracens were transformed into the people that we set out to destroy. Jerusalem. Twenty years have I been with the Saracens. Saladin's target is Jerusalem. The great ancient city is sacred to Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, and is the virtual capital of the Holy Land. If there can be a victor in this endless conflict, it will be the army that holds Jerusalem. To complicate matters, Saladin is determined not to harm the city itself. If a single holy shrine is damaged, the populace might well view Saladin not as a liberator, but as yet another conqueror. The last time I entered Jerusalem, as a crusading knight, I waded through the blood of victims. This time, not a building was looted, not a townsperson was injured. Saladin set free nearly every prisoner he took. The citizens of Jerusalem proclaimed Saladin as their savior. He offered to free them, but after 20 years in his service, I have decided to see this journey to the end. Tiberius, twenty and a half years of bloodshed. We are far from the ocean, so the Saracens interpret the smell of salt and commotion of seabirds as signs from heaven. I sit near Saladin's tent, watching the butchery below. Saracen horse archers sweep through yet another disorganized mob of European soldiers. The great Crusader nations have been reduced to puny city-states. Only Tiberius, Tyre, and Ascalon are still in Crusader hands. Nonetheless, these three cities are well fortified and could withstand any siege. Saladin has had many victories on the open desert, but the Crusader castles are unparalleled. If he is victorious now, the Holy Land will belong to the Saracens again. A failure could mean even more Decades of carnage. Once, I was amazed at the nobility of the Saracen warriors. Only a few years ago, they entered battle as gentlemen, bringing with them treasure chests, wine, singing girls, and collections of doves, nightingales, and parrots. No longer. In reaction to European hostility and fanaticism, 
The Saracens have steadily become more resolute, more bloodthirsty. Their love of art is replaced by a love for battle. Now, in answer to the Crusade, they have adapted their principle of Jihad for warfare. The result has been devastating to the Crusaders. The European presence in the Holy Land was finished. Or so everyone believed. The city of Accra. Nearly 21 years have I ridden with Saladin. When word of the Saracen victory at Jerusalem reached Europe, another crusade was launched. The kings of the three most powerful nations in Europe, England, France, and the Holy Roman Empire, embarked for the Holy Land with thousands of troops. Saladin knows that his most dangerous opponent is Richard the Lionheart of England, a brilliant tactician who learned the art of war fighting against his own father. He builds colossal fortresses and always fights in the front lines, the ideal of a heroic warrior. Richard's army has come ashore near Accra. Much of Saladin's army is trapped in the city, while two monstrous English trebuchets pound at Accra's walls. If Richard can defeat our army here, he can walk into Jerusalem on the coast. Saladin knows that this is the climax of his jihad. All of the Crusader states have fallen. If the Saracens can hold Accra, then the Europeans will be forced to return home. If Accra falls, in the centuries-long nightmare of eternal war, raid and counter-raid, begin again. All of Saladin's victories will be for nothing. The first year of my freedom. The fighting is over. The fire has gone out of Richard's lust for conquest. The two respected adversaries have begun to speak, finally, of peace. War is not gentle with men's health. Richard fell ill with a fever. Because he respected his enemy, Saladin sent Richard fruit and mountain snow to comfort him. Soon enough, Richard boarded a ship headed back to England. The Third Crusade is over. The final treaty was signed on September the 2nd, 1192. By its terms, Jerusalem remains in Saracen hands but Christian pilgrims are to be allowed to visit all the holy places, freely and safely. It seems a fitting compromise to a war that has been fought over religion and land. The war is over, but I do not think I shall ever set foot in Normandy again. I want to see the steel foundries in Damascus, and the gardens of the Caliph in Baghdad. I've never seen the mighty Crack the Chevalier, now fallen fortress of the Knights Hospitae. The Holy Land has many wondrous sights, and I can spend a lifetime here. It is peace in the Holy Land, for the moment. Sadly, in a land so small, home to so many different cultures, the birthplace of three of the world's great religions, I suspect that blood may one day stain the sand again.